Terrific. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so my name is Monica McCoopery, and I'm the Wildlife Education Specialist. And um, I'll let Grace introduce herself. We also have a slide for you guys, but we'll go ahead and get started. Hopefully everyone's here for um, uh, Aquatic Wild Educator Workshop. So we will be going until 1230, just so that everybody knows. I think that's when um, our session was supposed to go. So I think yeah. last time there was a little confusion. So we'll just make sure. Um, all right, I will go ahead and share my screen here. There we go. Can you see the big version? Everything good? All good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I couldn't see anyone nodding. I just saw. I can't just okay, perfect. All right, so uh, we're okay. We're going to be talking about the Aquatic Wild Educator Workshop today. So we're going to be uh, training all of you on this really cool curriculum guide that will hopefully give you some good ideas and some good confidence and some good knowledge on teaching um, in your library workshops in your libraries this summer. So um, just a few kind of um, workshop expectations so that everyone kind of knows what we're doing today. If you absolutely can, please keep your video on. Um, this helps us um, engage with our participants and have the quality of the workshop really. Um, it makes a difference and it makes Grace and I feel like we're not Kind of talking into oblivion or anything like that. It's always nice to see everyone's faces and, and be engaging. So um, also we've been doing Zoom for a while. Just mute yourself unless you're talking or speaking. Um, and you must attend the entire training today till 1230 um, to be able to get certified. So um, we will be sending out an evaluation at the very end, and that is how you will get your books. We will send those out based on who fills out those evaluations. And then if you can, um, make sure that you have a pen or a pencil and then maybe just some paper handy. Otherwise, that should be the only um, types of materials that you would need for the workshop. And then we are having some really fun activities today. Um, so be ready to participate and hopefully be very engaged. All right, here's a really quick agenda of what we're gonna be doing today. Um, we'll do a quick introductions here and then we have a few awesome activities that we'll do. We'll get up at about 11.30 for a stretch break because we all know that we need breaks um, even during Zoom. And um, then we'll wrap up at about 12.30 or so. All right, so really quick, um, like I said, my name is Monica McCubrey. I'm the Wildlife Education Specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission um, located in the Lincoln office. And I'm also what we call the Nebraska Project Wild State Coordinator. So the um, idea of Aquatic Wild is under a bigger umbrella called Project Wild. And we will kind of talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but I will let Grace introduce herself. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Grace Gard. I am I uh, work in the same office. I can hear Monica across the hallway. Um, and so I am the aquatic ecology education specialist. So, um, you know, Game of Parks does a lot of fishing and all kinds of hunting stuff. And we focus a little more on that education of the ecology side. And yeah, I have a degree in fisheries and wildlife, uh, same as Monica and working on my graduate degree. So excited to be with you guys and work on this uh, workshop with you today. When Grace and I were making an introduction, she had made hers first, and so I had to also put a photo of a fish on there too, so thanks Grace. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do introductions a little different today. Um, instead of uh, just saying your name and where you're from, we also would like you to connect to an animal today. So we have six different photos up here of some aquatic animals or animals that live by the water or in the water. And I want you to take maybe 20 seconds and, and look at all the animals and think which one you are relating to today. Um, it might be different than it would have been yesterday or tomorrow, but what are you kind of feeling today? Um, I'm gonna go first. I'm gonna really quick, I, I um, the frog down here, I am a frog person and this frog looks like it's had a lot of coffee and I feel like I have had a lot of coffee and he's bright eyed and ready to go. So um, I'm really relating to the frog today. Um, so if Grace, if you wanna go and then if we could uh, maybe popcorn to people. Um, so if you, Grace, if you wanted to pick someone from the audience participants to share their name and then what library you're joining us from today or where you normally work and then um, what animal photo you are kind of relating to. So Grace, if you wanna go ahead. Yeah. Um, oh, this is tricky. Um, maybe, uh, I think 
I think the snapping turtle is where I'm at. It looks, it looks pretty excited. I'm excited to have all of you with us today. So I'm, I'm pick that snapping turtle. Um, and I will just pass things on then to Sally Snyder. If you want to go. Hi, I'm Sally Snyder from the Nebraska Library Commission. And I love all these animals, but I have to go with the river otter because I've always been a fan of river and sea otters. And I love that his tongue's sticking out. So um, no disrespect to anybody. I just think he's awfully cute. <laughs> and let's go to uh, Sandra Welsh. I'm Sandra Welsh from the Wilson Public Library, and I'm with Sally on the river otter. He looks so furry and soft. That's where I am. Would you like to pick someone to go next? Um, how about Lori Yoakum? Um, I'm also from Wilson Public Library. I'm going to go with the axolotl um, simply because I'm kind of hiding in my office today, but I do have a cute little smile for you if you find me. I love and... that you know what that was. I forgot to mention um, the animal's name, so I'm very impressed that you know what that is. So that's awesome. Oh, I have a few kid kiddos who are in love with these right now. So. That's so cool. Um, I'm going to pick Denise Harders. All right. Well, I knew the axolotl, but, um, and I'm from the Central Plains Library System, and I'm running behind these days. I'm having a really big struggle right now. So I'm going to go with the yellow fish because I don't know what kind of fish he is, but he kind of represents how I'm doing right now. We also don't know what kind of fish it is. It just kind of looked like an emotion oh. that some people might have so yes yes and he fits me perfectly and i need to look and see because i don't have my list of participants up how about amy kaufman i don't know amy might not be able to use her microphone sometimes that happens oh um, yeah amy says she yeah. has patrons Totally fine. Yeah. Do, would you just like to pick somebody else? Yes, I will. How about um, Jennifer Einspar? Hi, I'm Jennifer from the Arapahoe Public Library. And I'm going with the mystery yellow fish too. Just the look of, hi, I'm here. Not sure what's going on today, but I'm here. Sounds good. You like to pick somebody else, Jennifer? Yes, I'm going to pick um, Jensen Memorial Library. Hi, you've got Mary Jo and Lori Johnson here. Just say we're both for the otter. We're both for the otter because <laughs> he's super cute. Um, we're just glad to be here and excited to learn a bunch of new stuff. Awesome. All right, would you like to pick someone else? Missy O. She might not be able to unmute. Yeah, she just did uh, in the chat. Oh, yeah, there she is. She said she picks the rib rotter. Looks like he'd enjoy sushi just like her. So very good. <laughs> Thank you, Missy. <laughs> um, how about we have uh, Annie go next if she's able to, if they're unable to mute or share. All right, another microphone issue. That's totally fine. Um, who else is here? Um, how about Steph? Oh, she Annie said that she would pick the axolotl as well. Oh, I'm sorry, she picked um, Brenna. My bad. Sorry, Steph. We'll get to you. Is Brenna able to talk? 
might be uh, might be good to skip, I guess. <laughs> yep. Um, Steph, how about you? I see that you're there, and hopefully you can unmute. You're talking to me. Yes. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I signed in a little bit late. Um, frogs, frog all the way. All right. Always... <laughs> yeah, that's totally fine. If you want to just tell us uh, your name and where you're joining us or what um, library you're with and then kind of which animal you're really connecting with today. Oh, um, I'm Stephanie from um, Seafood Preston Library in Orleans. And I, I've always been obsessed with frogs. <laughs> Good choice. Um, let's see. Has Gail Irwin gone yet? Can you hear me? I can, yes. Yes, I'm Gail Irwin from the Ainsworth Public Library. And I'm going to go with the turtle. Um, I didn't sleep very well last night. I got some stuff going on and I couldn't sleep. So I might be a little slow today and maybe a little crabby. That's all right, we all have those days, so. Um, Jenny Smith, have you gone yet? Uh, Jenny says she is with Wilson Public Library in Cozad, also another step away from her computer. That's totally fine. She said she would pick the river otter because she has a fascination with them right now. And then she picks the McCook Public Library. Oh, you guys are so good. Jody here from McCook Public Library. Frog, because I have my hands and fingers in everything. Very good. And awesome. Um, if you can, McCook Public Library, would you like to pick someone else that has not gone? Or maybe if anyone else can use their microphone. Oh, there we she There we go. I'm Nita Storm from Clyde Burt Memorial Library in Curtis. And I would pick the snapping turtle. I don't seem to be getting very far today. All right, well, hopefully that changes. Would you like to pick someone else? Um, everyone that shows up on my screen has been chosen. Okay, is there, I think there might be a couple of other people that maybe had come in a little bit later. Is there someone that had not gone yet? If you um, can unmute yourself, would you like to go who has not gone yet? I'm Carrie. Anderson from Hesh Memorial Library in Alma. And um, I would, I'm sort of like the yellow fish. I just found out I have an overactive thyroid and I'm real slow and sluggish. All right. Is there anyone else that has not gone that can? Um, Macy from Bassett says that she picks the little bird um, because I didn't want him left out. Yes, <laughs> I think Grace would probably agree. She loves those birds as well. So. Yeah, Amy did chime in above Macy and said also that she likes the the bird, which is a king, a type of kingfisher, not the type that we usually have in Nebraska or anything. But um, she, I like how she said it's because I feel like I'm flitting around like crazy today, and I can relate to that as well. <laughs> yes. All I'm right. Lori Medlin from the Grand Island Public Library, and I feeling like the yellow fish kind of tired. <laughs> All right. Anyone else that's able to unmute and talk or that we missed by chance? Uh, Kristen in the chat says she's from the Santel School in Dunning. Um, she'll be in and out, but uh, she feels like the turtle uh, hiding out at times. I'm right there with you. All right. Last call. Is there anyone else? Uh, this is Veronica from Mountland Memorial in Wood River, and I was going to choose the Kingfisher as well. We just read the book Mail Fell here not too long ago, and the kids loved it, so I'll go with that guy. All right, sounds good. All right, last call. Hi, uh, just joined. Um, I'm assuming... We're just introducing. Um, I'm yeah, from, just uh, your name and where library you're with, and then what kind of animal we're relating to today. All right, uh, Shelly from North Platte Public, and I am relating to the otter. Little snack always sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. All right. 
Anyone else? Okay, well, if I missed anyone else, you can certainly feel free to type that in the chat. If you come on late, um, you can go ahead and just add your name and your library as well. So fun little activity just to kind of get the introductions going. So, all right, so why are we all here today? So today we're going to be talking about um, uh, doing a curriculum and training on a curriculum called Aquatic Wild. So earlier I mentioned that uh, Aquatic Wild is kind of um, under the umbrella of something called Project Wild. So if you look at this photo here, the green one that says Project Wild way on the left. Um, so Project Wild was started back in the 80s as a way to teach um, conservation, environmental education, but also helping teachers to meet state standards. So um, it is an interdisciplinary conservation and education program that emphasizes wildlife. So it was very, very popular. People loved it and teachers couldn't get enough of it. So they introduced something called Aquatic Wild. So Aquatic Wild is very similar to Project Wild in the fact that it um, is interdisciplinary. It's just a little bit more um, streamlined into what the topic is. So Project Wild talks a lot about land animals and terrestrial ecosystems, whereas Aquatic Wild, as you can probably guess, talks a little bit more about water and water ecosystems and watersheds and tide pools. So it is a national program, both of them. So we always have to kind of keep that in mind that um, when you look through them where you see activities, you might think, oh, well, we don't have sea turtles or we don't have manatees. I can't do this activity. That's not true. Um, you just have to kind of twist it into something that we do have in Nebraska. We might not have um, sea turtles, but we do have turtles and we do have lots of water turtles. So um, Aquatic Wild and Project Wild kind of go together. Um, so all of you after this workshop, after filling out our evaluations, you will get to take home your own Aquatic Wild. We will be mailing it out to you. Um, and then something that also kind of stemmed from Project Wild was uh, an idea for very little littles called Growing Up Wild. So um, they actually recently just redid the book, uh, which is kind of exciting because it's been this really long thing that's hard to put on a bookshelf and it's, it's, it's crazy. I can't fold it. It would just drive me nuts. So they made it into a nice little eight and a half by 11. Um, and this is a great way to get little littles interested in observing nature and getting outside and understanding what they're looking at. So um, they're very awesome curriculums. Um, it teaches a lot of different skills and knowledge um, and it's environmental education. So you can't go wrong. So a little bit about just the history. I kind of mentioned this already. Um, it started in 1983. It was in 13 states. Um, it was kind of its own little entity. And then in 2017, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, or AFWA, um, kind of absorbed it. So um, it's a pretty cool curriculum guide. A lot of people have never heard of Project Wild, um, unless you're kind of in this conservation, I guess, world. Um, but it's starting to become more popular and a lot more teachers and um, after school providers and libraries are using it. So the primary audience um, for both Aquatic Wild and Project Wild is K through 12. So it's a very wide range of activities that you can use. Um, so since 1983, when it first started, it was only in 13 states. It is now in all 50 states, including Japan and Canada and the District of Columbia as well. So it's everywhere. Um, so since launching it, about 1.5 million people, educators have been trained. So um, the good thing is you will also be added to that statistic today when we are done. Okay, so why are we doing Aquatic Wild? What's, uh, what do you get out of it? What's the point of it? Um, so it is standards-based. It is very fun, hands-on, interactive activities, but they are based on national standards. Um, so if you know anything about um, Nebraska, like science standards and teaching standards, we don't have NGSS, which is like the national, basically what everyone else has. Nebraska is just a little bit different. But if you look through them and you compare them to NGSS, they're, they're pretty much the same thing. It's just called something different. So um, Nebraska, even though we're just a little bit different in what we call our state standards, they fit very well with the rest of the nation. Um, they also, Aquatic Wild will provide scientifically sound material. So you never have to worry about, um, is this scientifically accurate? Is this true? Um, everyone that reviews these um, are either teachers or conservationists. So the content is very high quality. And it also helps prepare um, highly qualified teachers. So we understand that not many of you 
um, get to work with students for a whole year, you might do a one-off program. Um, but the idea is that you can provide those really good high quality programs with good information. And it also provides effective professional development, which is what you are all doing today. All right, <clears throat> so what we're gonna do is uh, throughout the um, activity, oh, there was one thing I wanted to show you. So sorry, I'm gonna have to stop sharing my screen. Um, I was gonna ask all of you and you can just kind of raise your hands or shout out yes or no. How many of you guys like free stuff? Hopefully everyone raises your hand, everyone, right? So um, one of the things that Nebraska Game and Parks has to offer libraries and other people, yes, someone said free, obviously, yes. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we have to offer is we have a lot of educational kits and trunks that you can check out for free. Um, so one of the ideas is that we have um, things like mammal trunks and bird trunks. Um, these are big rolling toolboxes that you can just call and say, hey, is this available from June 4th through June 8th? And we'll say, yes, it is. You come pick it up, you use it, and you bring it back. So I really quickly just wanted to show you um, what that looks like. Um, so if you go to, there we go. So if you go to nebraskaprojectwild.org, um, maybe Grace, if you'd like to put that in the chat, um, this is what our page looks like. Um, so if you type in outdoornebraska.gov slash project wild or just nebraskaprojectwild.org, this is what it comes up as. So you can find a little bit more information here about Project Wild, Growing Up Wild, all the different educational programs that we are uh, curriculums that we have. And then you can also click on this little orange box over here, um, educational resources. So if you click on that, there's a lot of things that come up. Uh, one of the things that we have is an outdoor family event trailer. So this is a legitimate six foot by 10 foot trailer that you haul with a truck or a very large SUV. Um, this is a free activity um, that you can pick up and take with you. So it is a turnkey ready trailer. We have 13 different activities in here. Um, and it has everything that you need to do almost like a larger scale event. So there's folding chairs, there's easy up tents, there are activity bins that say, okay, this is nature tracks. Everything you need to do nature tracks is in that tub. Um, really, if you click learn more on here, um, it will show you a photo of it. Um, so this is what we have tables in here. We have fishing poles to practice casting. Um, so it's a very, very good, resource to have. We do have one in Nebraska. Um, we have three of them, sorry, North Fork, North Platte, and Lincoln. And then it's not quite on here yet, but we also have one in Scotts Bluff as well. So we have four of those trailers throughout the state. You don't want trailers that's too big for you. We also have, like I said, these educational trunks. So if you click learn more here, um, it will tell you all the different trunks that we have. So mammal, we have one called reading the wild trunk. We have a bird trunk, prairie trunk, um, binocular kits, a life cycle kit. Grace has a really cool aquatic ecology trunk. Um, and if you're like, huh, mammal trunk, what's in here? It will tell you every single thing that's in that trunk. So it talks about skulls and pelts. It talks about um, getting some hands-on lessons with there. And then it tells you, okay, we have some replica skulls in there. So we have a badger skull, we have a coyote skull, we have a possum skull, we have some furs, we have some track replicas, we have some binder activities. So these are really cool resources to check out. Um, you can click on any one of these and kind of figure out what this trunk looks like and what's in there. And then if you are very interested in checking some of these out, at the very, very bottom, you can see all the locations that have trunks and which trunks they have and the phone number you can call to check out those trunks. Um, not every uh, location has every single trunk just because of space, um, but somewhere hopefully within the range of you, you can find what you're looking for. So um, if anyone has any questions on those, please feel free to put them in the chat. But I did wanna kind of show you that as well because it's a really cool resource and um, really good for library programs as well. All right, we'll go back to our Okay. All right. Um, so uh, you kind of talked a little bit about our resources that we have, but now what I want to do is um, Grace and I are going to kind of walk you through aquatic wild. So we will 
literally do activities with you like we would do them with students. Um, so this science shows that the more activities that you personally do, the more likely you are to do them with other people or with students because you have that confidence and you have that knowledge and you kind of understand how these activities go. So we're gonna walk you through just a few activities that we've picked out that we really like. Um, they are also really easy at doing them virtually. Um, hopefully you never have to do them virtually again, but um, they, that is an option as well. They are very fun in person too. So uh, first one we're gonna do today is called first impressions. Uh, so the goal of this activity um, is to basically, we're gonna show you some photos of some animals and we want you to know how you feel about these animals. So um, this is good for lower elementary, but we've also done it with high school and college students. So it could be any age level. It's kind of a good intro if you're doing like a theme um, or if you're doing um, maybe a longer camp or something like that. So, um, so kind of talking about the value of animals and the contributions that they make. And since we are doing aquatic wild, we will be doing aquatic animals today. All right. So first animal, if any of you, what we're gonna do is normally we would have smiley faces up. We have a happy face, a medium face, and a frowny face. Um, so if you show you a photo of an animal that you really like, how about we do a thumbs up? Or if you can't um, unmute yourself or do that, you can always type it in the chat. If you don't like the animal, you can thumbs down. Or if you're like, mm, I don't really know, you can do the medium thumb, so happy, okay or sad, you don't like it. So if all of you could go ahead and do that for this first animal, um, this might look familiar, we just used this photo, but how do you feel about this animal, the snapping turtle? Are you liking it, not liking it, or kind of just meh? Well, how do we do it? I don't know if it's in the chat. I don't see no place else it could be. Um, if you can't show yourself, um, if you would like to just type in the chat, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, and maybe a quick reason why. Um, Sally, I see your hand is thumb up. Why are you in the thumb up category for snapping turtle? Because I love animals of all types and they need to be in our, in our environment. They contribute to the environment there. I don't want to be swimming in the pond with them though, because okay, that's they fair. can be grabbing my toes. <laughs> it's a all right. Um, was there, I couldn't see everyone's picture obviously, but there, is there anyone that had a thumbs down? If not, that's okay too. All right, I it think look, it looks yeah, like ahead. it looks like both uh, Gail and Annie said down or not very happy. So if you want to yeah. fill in why. If you guys want to say why, that would be great. If not, that's totally fine too. And this is Denise. I put thumbs down because it looks terrifying. Look at those great big claws and I'm afraid the snap would take off a finger. Okay. This is Gail. I put thumbs down too because he's very scary looking and they can grow very large and be very big. And I've seen them bite onto something and not let go. So it's scary. Yes. Uh, a lot of anglers don't like them because they do grab on the bait and then it, you lose all of your, your lures, your weights, everything. So yes, they they can sometimes be a little bit of a nuisance for people. Um, I see someone put in the chat, uh, thumb in the middle. They know they serve their purpose, but they don't want to go near them. Understandable. I'm not sure if you can see, but I do actually have a little young snapping turtle in the back here. He might be moving around during the day. So if you see him, say hi, Chomper. Um, he's about a six-year-old snapping turtle, just a common snapping turtle that we would have here in Nebraska. All right, so there's our first animal. If anyone didn't know, this is a common snapping turtle. This is a little guy. Um, they vary widely in colors, um, but we do have them. And someone said they get fairly large. They do. They can get up to about dinner plate size or even larger, um, 50, 60, 75 pounds sometimes. If you ever go to SRAM Education Center, they have Big Snap Daddy is his name. And you can go visit him and he weighs about 100 pounds. So big guy. All right. Second animal. How do you feel about this thing? I think we all probably know what it is. Thumbs up thumbs middle or thumbs down. Someone just said slap. All right, got it. <laughs> Love it. Thumbs down, sad face, thumbs down. Um, oh, oh gosh. Um, Tony, I see you put thumbs down. Why, why did you do thumbs down? If you can type in the chat.
I think of disease and bites. Yeah, most of the time, no one likes to get um, bit by a mosquito because you do um, itch most of the time. It's just our body reacting with their um, anticoagulant that they have um, so that they can suck your suck your blood. So um, yes, they make you itch every year. Some people are a little bit more sensitive to them. Um, my husband, every time he gets not stung, every time he gets bit by a mosquito, it like swells up. So, but it doesn't really bother me that much. It just kind of depends on who you are. So um, did anyone have a thumbs up? I think I saw all thumbs down or just a, a slap on that one. Um, why do you think you would sometimes see someone with a thumb up? Or anyone wants to Sally, Sally had a thumb in the middle. Okay, yeah, Sally, why do you have that middle thumb? Well, lots of animals eat them. Bats eat them and some other animals eat them. So yeah, like Lori Yoakum just said, food source for other critters. So they need to be around so critters can eat them. And also I'm sure they do something else, but I can't think what else, what else it might be. <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right. So a lot of animals eat these guys and it's a food source for a lot of different animals as well. So even though we might not personally like them, there's a lot of animals that rely on these guys as sometimes their main source of food. So um, uh, bats, like she said, are one of them. They do eat a lot of mosquitoes. Um, they eat a lot of moths as well. Um, but frogs, for instance, and um, lots of salamanders will eat these guys. Any thing really they um they just like to eat them and they're readily available there's lots of them so all right good food source for other critters dragonflies yeah dragonflies are um they catch them midair they're really fast and they're voracious predators and they just catch them midair so thank you um dragonflies all right how do you feel about this anyone wants to know it is a wood duckling all right, thumbs up, some love for the ducks. All right, um, anyone wanna say why? I saw Denise, your hand had thumb up. Why are you thumb up for the wood duck? Well, cause they're cute and fuzzy and they chirp in the springtime and um, they just, are there in the ponds? They just look pretty floating along there. Yeah. I see a lot of beautiful, adorable. Um, someone said, so cute, reminds me of these kids following me around. <laughs> My family raised a bunch of them um, in fifth grade and we got to release them into the wild. So yeah, so some people have really good connections with these animals. Um, even if you don't know a lot about these animals, you still have that good memory of them. So your first impression is usually good because you have a good connection with them. Um, a lot of people don't like mosquitoes because their connection is usually not very good. They don't see the animals eating them. They see, um, you know, disease and they see a lot of just irritation and being a pest because they bite you. So yeah, so there's good connections with those animals. So over time, you tend to have good connections. You have good uh, memories with those animals and over over time you tend to like them more. Um, also, if you, um, who was the, Lori said that their family raised them, um, so they probably knew quite a bit about them. They saw them eat, they saw them hatch, and so um, you have those good information, you have that good knowledge, so over time you tend to like those animals and respect them a little bit more. All right, how do you feel about this animal? This is a bluegill, if anyone would like to know. We thumb up, middle thumb, or thumbs down. All right, Shelly, I see your thumbs up. Why are you thumb up for the bluegill? Well, we fish for them out here. Um, take the grandkids out, they love to catch them. And actually they're pretty good to eat. It just takes about 20 of them to- <laughs> Yeah, to get <laughs> To make dinner. Yeah. <laughs> um, I see some people had middle thumbs. Why are we middle thumbs? Anybody? Someone said, meh, they nibble on me when I swim in the sand pit. Okay, meh, you're right. <laughs> it is a little bit of a shock when a fish bites you. <laughs> um, I don't see any thumbs down unless I miss somebody. 
All right, I see a lot of people, they like to catch them, thumbs up, they spend time with their grandkids. So again, it might not be like the sexiest fish in the world, but it is something that you have good memories with and you take your grandkids and you go fishing with your kids. And it's usually one of the first fish that people catch. They're fairly easy to catch either that or a sunfish or um, something like that. So it's usually that first fish, good memories. And again, you have that good connection with those animals. All right, how do you feel about this animal? If anyone would like to know, this is an osprey. So this is one of our large birds of prey that we have here in Nebraska. Lots of thumbs up. Thumbs up. Um, I see one middle. I think that's it. Um, I think it was Shelly. Why are you middle thumb? Um, I mean, it's a beautiful bird. And I know it has to eat, but I don't like to watch a predator doing its job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know they do it and you just you just don't want to be there to kind of witness it. Is that correct? Yeah, that's understandable. Beautiful as long as they stay away from me. Yes. Thumbs up, thumbs up. A lot of thumbs up. Good. Um there, there was one thumbs down, and I'm really curious. Oh, was there? There yeah, green SM, green sim. Oh, okay. Yeah. Would that person like to either put in the chat or unmute yourself if you can and say why your thumbs down? If you can, they might take a second here. That'd be Spencer. Might not be able to. That's okay. We'll give him a second in the chat. Um, but yeah, this is an osprey. Um, my daughter just watched a Curious George episode about ospreys. And so um, they were like super excited to see it. And uh, so this is in Nebraska. They're not, Gracie might know more. They're not super common to see. Is that right? Or is it certain times of the year for ospreys? They don't always nest here, but they could. Um, and yeah, they're, they're definitely, I've seen them on regular lakes around. Oh, okay. Uh, and seen them catch a fish once or twice so it's kind of cool um so green sm just said we have a lot of hawks where we live and kill a lot of our birds we love watching and we have to be careful with our cats and the hawks and the owls so um yes that's a very real thing um that's not um rare at all for a owl to um take a cat they clearly cannot carry all of it at one time but they will um, dismember it actually. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the things that they do and that's kind of a telltale sign that it is an owl that does something. Um, we had a friend who had some backyard ducks and slowly one by one, they disappeared from an owl. So it is a very real thing. If you kind of think about it, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. It's like a super easy thing. The ducks couldn't get out. And I mean, that was like an easy thing for a predator. So oftentimes you, you know, chickens, you lock your chickens up in the coop at night. They should have done that with their ducks as well. So um, it certainly does happen, but um, it, it is one of those things where they have to eat as well. And, that's well, and the, the nice thing about the osprey is that they are like solely fish hawks. They only eat fish and they have a really good success rate of catching them, which I mean, yeah, so they're kind of different from the regular hawk because they eat all fish. All right. All right. How do you feel about this animal? And if anyone's curious, this is a barred tiger salamander. So this is the same uh, species. This one just has not metamorphosed yet. So it has not changed into an adult. It still has the fuzzy little gills that it will use. Um, so this is what the adult will look like then. So this is a species that we do have in Nebraska. Thumbs up, thumbs up. What a smile, so cute. Smiling, thumbs up. Kind of cute, but I'm not touching it. Understandable. Thumbs up. Um, are we thumbs up, most of us? Thumbs down, middle. Eh, kind of starting, startling to come across. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone want to say why they would have been in the, besides the people in the chat, want to say why they were in the thumbs up category? Someone said they're harmless, looks cute, but slimy. They are definitely kind of slimy. They kind of feel like jello. I don't do really too. know what they eat, but um, they do look harmless. And I kind of want to cuddle that one in my hand and pet it. I think it wouldn't like that. <laughs> I don't think he can bite me. Maybe he can. Yeah. Well, so I don't know. 
Yeah, so this is just a tiger salamander. So they eat pretty much anything they can fit in their mouth. This would include insects, small fish, um, mosquitoes, ladybugs, dragonflies, worms, spiders, literally anything they can catch and fit in their mouth. So um, they, if you ever have touched like the inside of a fish's mouth, they kind of have those um, like plastic cone kind of feeling teeth. That's what these guys have. So even if he bit you, you probably would not feel it at all. Um, but these guys are found in Nebraska, depending where you find them within our state depends on what they look like. So if you find them kind of in the southern part of Nebraska, they're going to have what looks like a bar kind of coloring or patterning. And then on the western side, they're going to have more of a reticulated, almost a spot. Same exact species. There's just depending on where you find them within our state. Um, my mom always talked about how she would have them in the cellar. So they like very cool, damp places. Um, one of the really neat things is a lot of people don't understand is that the best places to find tiger salamanders are actually in the sand hills, um, which someone's like, sand, it's, it's dry. Why? Um, they have all those like vernal pools. And so when it rains, the lakes just come up because the water table is so low and it's a great place to find salamander. So the really pretty bright yellow salamanders like you see in this picture here. So, all right, I think that was it. So um, this is a fun activity to do. Um, clearly you don't have to use aquatic animals, but we just did today because it is aquatic wild. And so talking about um, animals and how people feel about them, um, maybe busting some of those myths or stereotypes around some of these animals, um, but then just also kind of gauging where people are. So especially for kids, um, I always tell like teachers, for instance, to do this at the beginning of a unit um, and kind of gauge where they are. And then maybe there's some animals that they need to kind of focus a little bit more on, um, usually spiders, worms, snakes, that kind of thing, things that people are not necessarily always fond of. Um, so getting that information to them and then uh, doing this again at the end of a unit and kind of seeing if their um, opinions have changed once they have that more information and that knowledge about these animals. So um, anything you wanted to add to this, Grace, or anything? Nope, I think you covered it. Okay, awesome. Well, I will let Grace take over for the next activity. My, do you want me to stop sharing, Grace? Um, I don't know if you don't mind. I think we can make it work. Yeah, just let me know when you want me continuing to continuing to share. So yeah, I'll just be that annoying person that's like, oh, oh you're fine. To the next slide. <laughs> um, yeah. So this next activity we're gonna do is called uh, "Are You Me," and it is very appropriate for lower elementary students. So those are, I mean, even um, you know pre-K almost, so just kind of depends, but um, very good for younger students. So keep that in mind kind of as we, as we go on. Good, Monica, here we go. Um, so this activity in the booklet, you'll, you'll kind of notice once you get this curriculum that we have done our own adaptations of these and you can do the same when you when you get this curriculum and you decide kind of how it will work best in your own space. So um, with, with this activity, it does say to have students bring in a picture of themselves when they were like a baby and then from today, or you could just use their today body, you know, and, um, and, and to see if they can find the match, like whose baby, which baby picture matches to which, um, you know, kid. So, same thing, just to make you guys think about it. Like if we had brought all pictures of us uh, as babies to today, would we be able to match them? Do you think that we could? And feel free to add that in the chat, like the answer to that question. Do you think we could, what would help us, you know, make those matches or what would make it really hard? And anyone can feel free also to unmute and share. Anybody? What might help us or hinder us from being able to match the young? Okay, Gail says no hair to maybe lots of hair. So that could make it difficult to find who's matches who. Um, you might be able to use the hair more or less teeth. Um, <laughs> So as with most of my family, I was bald for the first year of my life. So that would make it kind of hard. And hair color can actually change, you know, from when you're really young to when you are older, like 
pretty sure my sister originally had brown hair and now she has blonde hair. So that's definitely some, some things to just get, get you thinking about this um, activity. Yeah, color of eyes might change a little bit as well from when, you know, when you're first born, that can change a lot. So um, yeah, we'll go to the next slide here, Monica. Yeah, just lots of different changes happen. Um, and we can probably just go on to the next one. So just keep, I want you to think about that um, as we go into this activity. So with the activity, Are You Me? There are cards that come in the curriculum that look like this. And so they have the um, adult and then they have the young. And the whole goal is to pass these out to kids and have them see if they can find the match. and. Um, so the way that I'm doing it with you is a little different, but you could pass them all out at once. In this case, I'm going to first challenge you. Um, and so you can go on to the next slide, Monica. I'm going to challenge you with um, a test to see if you can match the aquatic vertebrates in the game with the adults with the young. So, um, and really fast, what is a vertebrate? Make sure we know. Yeah, go ahead. They Sally. have a backbone, they have bones. Yeah, they have a backbone, they have a spine. So that's always when you're doing this activity with little kids, it might be good to like have them feel their spine and really solidified so they know, you know, this is this is what makes them different. Yeah, they have a spine that's on the inside of their body, whereas invertebrates might not. So I'm gonna put a link in the chat and this will take you away from you know your current slides. Um, and that's all right, but this is just a little online um, quiz. And so this was the best way virtually to get you guys to see if see how well you do with trying to match up the two different, two different um, adults versus young. So go ahead and do that. I'll give you like one or two minutes. Um, and so just take, take a few minutes and see how you do with that little quiz. Hopefully, let me know if you're having issues with it popping up, but should just take you to that are you me green and then just hit that start yellow bar and it should should take you into the matching type of a quiz that we have there. And when you're done, feel free to put like a thumbs up in the chat so I know you're done. Oh, someone said they didn't see it. So I would just try again to use that link. Um, and then when you get to that green page, you'll hit the yellow start bar. Perfect, lots of people are getting done. So um, we can go to the next slide, Monica. Um, how did it go? And if you didn't get through it, no worries. Um, but I, I do wanna see how things went for you. So feel free to put it in the chat or if anybody wants to share um, out loud, we'd love to hear just how did it go? Which, which things helped you make the match? What, what, was, what was helpful or maybe not helpful? Anybody? Well, I missed seeing the tadpole. So I thought the turtle or the frog was um, from the eggs. So that was, I missed that one. So I didn't get a good, very good score, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes too, um, the, it can be, I, can, I would blame it on the picture sometimes too. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh, someone, I forget it shows uh, how fast you did it. So they said, I beat them by 10 seconds. Um, came down to birds and then noticing the nest in one picture helped them. So that's definitely great use of your clues that you have in those pictures. Um, anybody else, like anything that really helped, helped you recognize the young and the old and that they matched? I'm just going to say it's all those children's books I've read throughout the years of the, the animals being born and or hatching or whatever and what they look like then and, and as they grow because mm -hmm. I got to get it back to books every once in a while. 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's some really great life cycle books out there too. So this would be a great activity to pair with some life cycle stories. Um, and so, yeah, we did actually talk about Osprey a little, so maybe that, maybe that helped a little bit, but, um, I'm going to just go ahead and give you guys the next link. And I think Monica can go to the next slide. Um, and we're going to try your hand and see how you do with invertebrates. And just remember that if you were doing this in person, you would have all these cards cut out and separated and mixed up and you would hand them to each kid would get one of them. And then they would try to walk around and find their match. But in this case, and Monica, feel free to add anything. Yeah. And in the in the book that you will get in Aquatic Wild, those cards that Grace had on there, those um, blue and white ones, they're all in the book so you can copy them. Or what's easier is that they're all on a PDF and I can show you online where to get those resources. And then you can just print them from your computer instead of holding the book to make a copy. So um, yeah, definitely. All right. Here is the link to the second quiz it's the same style same website um and so i'll give you some time and again when you're done feel free to put your the thumbs up in the chat so we know uh you're ready to keep on moving these are all aquatic invertebrates and i think we all know what those are but again um insects that they just don't necessarily have a they don't have a backbone they have a type of a skeleton that's more on the outside of their body. So give you a little time. I see someone laughing. <laughs> uh, Lori says, exceeded the number of tries. And if you get to that point and you want to just put a thumbs up in the chat too, that works for me. <laughs> Lori says the same. All right, is that how everybody's feeling? Yes, looks like it. Okay, uh, so thinking back to the first round and then thinking about these, what was not helpful or what was helpful if you did get a match? Um, so let's just take some time to talk about that. Uh, let's see. Sally said she got one right. So I'm sorry, I keep picking on you, but if you want to share how you got it right, or was it just by luck? Uh, it's because we saw it earlier in the sample oh. of the things. So I, I got that one right away. And the, the thing that makes it hard for me is a lot of those young stages are very similar to each other. So then mm. I just started doing trial and error. Okay, this top one, I still didn't find this match before I ran out of time. So I was just going to, click until I it connected with something, but I didn't even get that done. Yeah. 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 Nope. That's a, it makes sense that they would look a lot alike, but it makes it hard. Yeah. But, uh, you guys were really observant on the two examples I gave you because I, I feel like I wouldn't have noticed and remembered. So good job, at least being observant with that. Um, it didn't work to go down the line. Uh, very hard too when you're not familiar with the type of animal and I guarantee you most people no matter what age you are with those little kids like they're not going to recognize them either be familiar with them at all um and and that's okay but sometimes then it's we can talk about what strategies could we use to help us and even then with these macro invertebrates it would be very very difficult and um so sometimes uh you can go to the next slide here Monica um, sometimes it's, um, it can come, we, sorry, next one too, since we kind of been talking about 
there are less clues obviously to utilize. And the big reason is because all of these insects go through metamorphosis. And so we know we're all familiar with like caterpillars and butterflies in their life cycle, but um, this can be a really good opportunity to get kids to realize like lots of different insects go through metamorphosis and a lot of them live in water. And so just two that I'm gonna highlight, um, if you wanna go to the next slide here, Monica. Um, dragonflies, super common, no matter where you live, there's lots of different kinds of dragonflies. And so you can see there's the two, uh, the upper left and lower right are, are examples of that dragonfly nymph stage. And so when they're, they're young like that, they're underwater and they will just continuously like go through molting or shedding until they eventually grow enough the last time that those wings are ready. And then um, they actually come up out of the water on a stem of grass and then they will just actually molt that, that skin one last time. And then they just have to wait a little bit for their wings to dry out, kind of like butterflies, but they just never go into a chrysalis or anything. And then they're ready to go. So um, cool thing about dragonfly larvae underwater is that they eat mosquito larvae. Um, so that's handy, you know, they eat them when they're young and when they're old. And um, one clue that maybe kids could use is the number of legs. Like you can count number of legs from dragonfly nymph to adult, but again, it's, it's tough. And that's the whole point is we want kids to realize that it can be really hard <laughs> and that's because they go through metamorphosis. So, um, yep, you can go to the next one. One other one that I wanted to highlight that's definitely another challenging one is the caddis fly. And um, if you're along the Platte River at all, there's definitely some caddis flies that live in there. And uh, they're really cool. Obviously you can see they have, if you count, they do have those six legs. Um, you know, three on each side, but uh, then they also make this unique case around themselves. They will build a casing around them uh, out of, you know, the gravel and sand and things in the water, and it helps camouflage them and it helps protect them because a larva about that age is not, you know, they're easy food for a fish and for lots of other things. So, um, and then as you can see, they grow into kind of an unimpressive, um, type of a fly, but if you do like to uh, fish for trout, this is a very um, a, a very common type of insect that trout like to eat and, and obviously lots of other fish. So, um, so yeah, I wanted to just highlight those, but as you can see, it is very challenging. And again, these are the foundation that kind of help our aquatic ecosystems function the way they do and stay healthy. And, you know, it's all about that food web. So um, I don't know if I had another slide here. All right, a couple extensions we'll mention throughout. Um, this could be a good way to lead into researching habitats. Um, you can also go visit a habitat and look for these. And that's where, when Monica was talking about those trunks, um, we have the aquatic ecology trunk where you can go uh, use the nets and dip in the water and look for these different insects. And they can actually tell you a lot about the water quality as well. So, and then like we mentioned, there's lots of great books, kids books about life cycles. So this would be a great activity to kind of use with them and honestly just generate a lot of discussion between, between your group. So, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for Are You Me? Oh, we're going right into Fashion of Fish. Sally or uh, Shelly, you're familiar with this, right? Yes, Shelly uh, did a year of trout in the classroom with me. So um, sorry, you have to have this one repeated, but <laughs> um, so Fashion of Fish is a fantastic activity and um, again, good for lower or upper elementary. And honestly, even up to our age, I think it's pretty fun. So um, pretty, pretty great activity all around. Can go to that next slide, Monica. All right, so this one again, we'll use the chat again, or if you wanna answer in person, let me know. But what do you think of when you hear the word adaptation? And I'll give you a second if you're typing it in the chat. Ooh, one word, change from Carrie. Yep, change to fit in, blending, change how they adjust to their environment. Key word there is definitely environment. Nice. A lot of you guys are, are mentioning that, which is great. Um, and how, how they adapt and fit into their environment. Yes, 
Those are great. All right, we can go on to that next slide. So how, so then if we're thinking about adaptations, how do we categorize different adaptations? And I will give you some hints here. I'm thinking of two, if we separate adaptations into two broad categories, what would those two broad categories be if we're thinking about adaptations? One has to do with how they might act and one has to do with how they might look, but they have specific names. So we'll see if you guys can, can come up with them here for a second. Camouflage is a good example of things that are on their body. Okay, so we'll go on to this next slide. So here's the first one. Oh, Megan, good job. We will get to beha behavioral is one of them. And then the other one, structural is a good, you know, that fits right in with physical. So physical adaptations, and I'm just running through this. This is how I run through it with kids. And I always think it's important to pause and define terms for them just to make sure, you know, that they know what we're talking about. So when we say physical, those are things that are on our body, right? So sometimes I'll have kids like, okay, hold up your hand. Is that a thing on your body? Yes, you know, and thumbs especially are a great example of humans' physical adaptation is the fact that we have thumbs. And so I get kids to kind of think about the fact that not every animal has thumbs and how do thumbs help us, right? So that's a good example of a physical adaptation or like you see on this elk, um, it's got really big antlers on its body can see them, you could touch them. So that's a good way to know it's a physical adaptation versus behavioral adaptations. Um, and that's obviously like sometimes how they use that physical adaptation or what they do, how they act. Okay. And so getting kids, sometimes that behavioral word can like take a second to click in this, this type of situation. So like with the elk here, they are able to kind of fight for mates because they have those antlers. So that's a behavior that they can do that not everyone, not all other animals do. Um, and then also we could go back with, with the kids to the thumb example, what behaviors can we do because we have this thumb? And so that's just another way to kind of run through that with them and make sure that they understand like a behavioral adaptation is what you do or how you act. All right, so then we can jump into fish. And we're gonna look at two fish species that are from Nebraska um, that are fairly common. And the things that I would just say to really pause and notice are the fin shapes and where they are located on their body, uh, the color that's on the fish's body, their eye size, their feeding behaviors, or maybe like what their mouth looks like, um, and then their body shape, because it's really easy in your head Anyone can draw a very generic picture of a fish, but when you pause and you start thinking the fact that they have very different types of those things, um, that's what I want us to look at. So we're gonna go to our first fish type here. Um, yep, perfect. We're gonna take a second and you can put it in the chat or again, we can uh, share out loud, but just go ahead and make some observations of this fish about its physical, things that are on its body that you notice that might be a good adaptation um, or just help it survive. So I'll give you guys, cause I know typing sometimes takes a little while. Large mouth, very good tone. The colors that it has, Sally. Well, I was just gonna say the, the large mouth looks like it can just scoop up anything it runs across. Um, very good, yeah, yes. Uh, we have large bulging eyes. <laughs> um, let's see, lo love this picture. <laughs> uh, fin shapes are interesting. Sharp fins on top. We've got gills. Yeah, very good at, um, observations here. Um, so I like that Sally and a few of you pointed out that it has a very large mouth and it's called a large mouth bass for a reason <laughs> uh, because it does have giant mouth. 
Um, and if any of you have ever fished for these, uh, they are a lot of the lures that you use to fish for them with, uh, you know, are like things like jumping frogs, because that's something they like to eat, and even crayfish and, and other things that, um, so that's one thing to think about, like the behavior that happens with this fish. It often will jump or launch out of the water to grab something with that big mouth. It just jumps with it wide open and hopes that it catches something, right? Um, we also mentioned those large eyes. If it has large eyes, it probably relies on them a lot for hunting too as well. So that's something to think about with its environment. Large eyes help it see. We have a really great one, dark colors on top, light colors on the bottom. And this is really, really important for, you know, this fish is definitely a predator. It likes to eat other fish, other insects, things in the water. And so when it's swimming around and there's little things on the bottom of the floor that look up, it blends in really well with that light color up at the top of the water versus say if an osprey is cruising around looking for some food, looking down on it, it's dark and it blends in with the water better. So very good. Like Monica said, it's called counter shading. I did not even know that. So thanks for teaching me something, Monica. <laughs> I didn't know it had an official name. Um, and then uh, one other thing I want to mention is just those spiny rayed uh, fins, dorsal fins on the top. That's a good, good observation to make as well. And um, again, if you think it usually will get attacked from above. And so if you've got these spiny rays that you can kind of shoot up, I mean, anyone that's been fishing too knows to kind of watch out for those on a lot of fish. So, so yeah, so this fish clearly has some really great adaptations to help it survive. Um, if you are a bass fisher man or woman, uh, you will also know that they like to be in areas with lots of vegetation and um, so it has a really great coloration to kind of help, help with that. All right, we got one other fish I'm going to show you from Nebraska, and this is called a paddlefish. So again, take a couple minutes here and just type in or feel free to share out loud some observations that you have about this fish and its body and anything you notice. Long nose, small eyes, wide fins. I like those. Also a long body. Great, great observations. It looks smooth. There are no spikes or spiny, spiny rayed fins. Amy says reminds them of a shark, which is def definitely a great, great observation. Um, and then, yeah, it looks kind of smooth. More fins on the bottom, maybe to counterbalance the nose. I like this, this thinking here. Mm -hmm. Those are good thoughts. There's really no color variation. It's all the same color. Awesome observations, everyone. So, so yeah, I'll go through a couple of these then, but feel free to keep adding anything else you notice. Um, First of all, again, I always want us to pause and think, does this fish live in a different environment than the bass? Because we think of aquatic habitats and it's easy to, if you're just quickly making a judgment, it's easy to think they're all the same. So just be thinking about that as we go through these. So someone really, I'm glad they mentioned, this has small eyes. So if you have small eyes, do you rely on them very much to find food? Not really, okay? That long nose is called a rostrum. And the rostrum is actually really cool. It has sen sensitive cells in it that can kind of detect electromagnetic currents in the water. And so as it swims, it can pick up, um, you know, where there's tiny like plankton or algae, zooplankton that are in the water. That's actually what they eat. So they can detect the current that comes from those living things and then just they swim through it and have their mouth open and that's actually kind of how they get their food. So don't really need eyesight, have a cool sensitive nose called the rostrum. Um, I really like everyone saying maybe lives by rocks because of the lack of color. Think of in Nebraska uh, what we have that doesn't have much color. It's probably dark and murky so you can't, you don't even 
you can't see, so you don't need to see very well. Um, and it's kind of just brown like that. Mud, we have a certain river called the Big Muddy. Does anyone know what that river is? I like the thought of logs in a lake and they might make their way into a lake and be in a lake, but they also have a body that's really well adapted to live in a river like the Missouri River. So a really fast flowing channel of a river. Um, and so a lot of the design, it's very smooth because it's always kind of swimming through. Um, there's not a lot of drag on it then and it blends in very well with that muddy river. So, um, so yeah, this, these are just two examples of real life fish in Nebraska that I wanted to share. And then, oh, I tried to hit next like it was, like I have control. <laughs> Um, and then I just wanted to show a quick slide here about the diversity of fish. This is barely scratching the surface of diversity of fish in Nebraska, but these are all really fantastic illustrations that we had someone do of different kinds of fish in Nebraska. So as you can see, there are many different kinds, different body shapes, different mouth types, fin types, all kinds of things like that, even colors. So um, the reason for this is because we have very diverse aquatic habitats. So what we're going to do, and I didn't, I, we have a decent amount of time here. We're going to actually make our own fish. You are going to fashion a fish. And sometimes we really like to do this activity with Play-Doh. It can be very fun that way. But um, today we'll have you draw because it's easier for us here. Uh, and so you can go on to that one next slide. Maybe. Someone really quick asked what oh. the orange and blue fish was on the back. Oh, yeah. Part. Um. Oh my gosh, now I'm going to blink on Is what the that darter. Called. It's Some a darter, darter right? yes. Yeah, thanks, Monica. <laughs> okay, I thought it was a pumpkin seed fish, and then I was like, nope, that wasn't on there. So, yeah, yeah, I think it might be called the Iowa darter, but I'll have to triple check. Um, we have a nice Nebraska fish book that. Right, I now they read. made everybody dizzy. There you go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, here are some cards that are also in your curriculum that you'll get. And, like Monica said, they have a more simple version to print than trying to copy it out of the book. But there, what I want you to notice is that there's four categories. One is body shape, one's mouth or feeding parts, one is coloration, and the last one, which is more of a behavioral adaptation, is reproduction and like how they lay eggs or have live birth. And so what you would do with, you, with your group if you're doing this in person is you would cut out all these cards and make sure each kid gets a stack of four, or adults, because you can do this with adults, um, and one, there should be one card from each category. And then what they'll do is make their own fish based on those, um, the qualities that came in their little stack. So in this sense, like if you wanna actually hit, I have some animations here, Monica. So um, just through all four and then you should be good. So say you got a stack that had vertical disc shape, elongated jaw, uh, vertical stripes and the eggs deposited on vegetation you will then make a, your own fish based on those four cards, okay? So what we're gonna do is give you some time. I'll give you like five minutes, because I think, yeah, we got time for that. So um, at least we'll give you five minutes. Uh, you'll choose, so I you can use the like ones that I outlined to guide you, or you can choose your own. Just make sure you choose one from each category and go ahead and spend some time here. We'll just like kind of take a, Monica and I will step back for a few minutes and let you create your own fish. So this is where you need a piece of paper and maybe a couple colors. And do remember, if you get through this kind of fast, the most important part that influences adaptations is the environment. So make sure you include an environment around them because that is what determines why they look the way they do. Okay, so we'll give you some time. Let us know if you have questions.
Maybe take like one more minute or two. I'll give you two. I think you have time for two. Nice, I'm seeing some good fish coming up on the screen here. Great, yeah, so um, if everyone's kind of okay with it, we'll go ahead and take some time to share a couple. So if you wouldn't mind um, unmuting yourself, holding up your fish and explaining to us, um, you know, a little bit about your fish's adaptations and why why it has those. So does somebody want to go? All right, so it started with the humpback um, sockeye shape. So it's in a river and nice. but it, it's got the big wide mouth. So it's gonna be looking for little baby fish. So there's some greenery there that it can find the little the little fish. Mm -hmm. um, because it goes in the greenery, it's got the stripes, the vertical stripes of like the croaker there. And then it deposits its eggs on the bottom of the river. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Shelly. Are there any reasons that laying their eggs in the bottom of the river might be good? like a benefit to them? A benefit, well, um, let's see. There's gonna be a fresh water supply going over them with maybe oxygen. Mm -hmm. And uh, they should be more protected maybe than floating on top. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Rather than being out in the open, they're all kind of down in between all the rocks and gravel. They're actually fairly well hidden. So um, that can be good for the fish. And uh, even, yeah, lots of lots of fish kind of use that strategy. So yeah, thanks for sharing. That's great. And I think um, an important part of this activity is definitely the giving kids a chance to like explain and reason out and tell us what they were thinking. Because sometimes it's, it's helpful for them as well to be able to explain it out loud. So does anyone else want to share theirs? I saw um, Lori put in the chat, vertical disc, long lower jaw, vertical stripes. Um, it's a punk rocker, rocker barracuda. I like that. <laughs> um, and if you think just pause and like, you can always ask about specific adaptations like the elongated lower jaw, why might that be beneficial? Any ideas? A longer lower jaw, what would that might be helpful for for a fish? Maybe to grab a, a smaller fish and hang on to it. It's got the, the longer jaw to come up underneath it and keep it from escaping. Yep. Yep. You're exactly right. And, and it's okay to be wrong, but you know, this is a great chance for kids to be comfortable sharing something, even if it's not right, it's, it's fine. That's not the point of this activity, right? So the point is just to brainstorm, 
think about these different parts and pieces of these fish and why they have them. And so this is a really fun one that kids can get really creative with. And I, that's why I mentioned drawing your environment as well, because you always have a few kids that go through it so fast and it's kind of clear they didn't really think. So making them pause and think about the habitat, because again, that is one of the most important parts of this, of this uh, activity. And with adaptations is to make sure that link is happening where people understand, um, you know, a fish looks the way that it does because of where it lives. So um, let me see if I had anything else major on this one. Yeah, I don't think so. We just talked about it. So yeah, Monica, I think it will go to you. We have an agenda break in here. Do people want the break or do they want us to keep going? and get through everything faster. Everyone's like, well, I, I, I could get down a little early and get to my lunch and maybe I'm up for keep going. And you guys are all welcome to, you know, run to the bathroom. It's yeah. very informal. So if you need to stand up and stretch or go get a snack or something, we totally get that too. So, okay, we'll just go ahead and keep going then. Um, one thing I did want to mention, Grace, maybe you said this too, and I just didn't hear it. Um, with that activity, instead of drawing, you could also have them do like Play-Doh. Did you mention that, Grace? Okay, I'm so sorry, I'm, I did not hear that, so, okay. Never that's hurts to mention things twice. Yeah, no, that's totally okay. <laughs> awesome, all right, well, we will go ahead and keep going. Um, so we are going to do another activity. This one is really fun to do in person, but we'll do the best we can as far as being virtual. Um, this one I really like because we talk a little bit about urban animals and urban wildlife. And I know not all of us are in urban areas or what we consider an urban area, I guess. But, um, you know, 66% of all of our population in Nebraska is considered an urban area. Um, so it's becoming more prevalent and um, it's, there's still wildlife in those areas. So this one's called Water Safari. So we're going to go on a safari today with water. Um, so we were going to um, observe and identify and describe wildlife and potential sources of water at a study site. Um, this one could be, it says for lower elementary, but you could make it even for upper elementary and even middle school um, and even high school investigations as well. You can um, really change this activity to make it whatever you want it to be. All right. So um, I want you to think about animals um, and no matter what type of animal they are, whether they are a wild animal, um, what's an example of a wild animal? Someone said, what's a wild animal? What would you say to them? Not tame, a badger. Yes, most of the time people do not have badgers as pets. Um, they, so the, true definition of a wild animal. Yes, yeah, someone said lives on their own and does not depend on humans. That is exactly it. So they are able to get their own um, resources to survive. Um, domesticated animals, on the other hand, would be like your dog and your cat. And these are animals that pretty much rely on us for food or sorry, for um, their resources. So um, I almost just gave it away. But so thinking about whether you are a ladybug or a elk or a bluegill or a starfish or whatever. What are the four things that everything needs to survive? You can either type in the chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself too. There are four things that every animal needs to survive. What do you think those are? Food. Food is one. Someone put in the shell in the um, chat. I saw shelter. Someone said air, sleep, food, water, oxygen. Okay, between all of us, we got it. So actually, I don't know if I've seen one yet. So there is food, water, shelter, and then space is actually the other one. So if you think about where you are right now, um, could you survive in that spot for the rest of your life? It might not be ideal, and it probably is not ideal. But do you have enough food? Do you have enough water? Probably don't have a lot of space. Like I really like my office, but I do not want to live here the rest of my life. Um, and I, I do have shelter, so I would be covered there. But no matter what animal you are or organism, 
Um, some need to breathe air, but there are some that actually do not. So we technically don't say that air is a key resource. Food, water, shelter, and space is what the book at least goes off of. And so when we say these things, it's also the proper arrangement of something. So if you are a squirrel, um, your whole home range might be within a mile. So you can get all your resources, your food, your water, shelter, and space within a mile of each other. Well, if you think about a larger animal like a deer, like a white-tailed deer, they need more space to run. And sometimes their territory can be 150 miles. So within that area, they would need to get their food, water, shelter, and space. So it just depends on the type of animal and the size of the animal. But those four things have to be in the proper arrangement. And so since we are doing aquatic wild today, we're really gonna focus on that water aspect as far as those resources. All right, so I want you to think about um, some water sources where animals might get water. Um, these might be very different um, depending on the size of the animal and where you are located, but just what are some areas where animals could go get water, whether they are a raccoon, a grasshopper, or a deer, where are some places they could go get water? The river, good. Horse tank, pond, lake pond. Ooh, someone said dew on the grass, good. Puddles, ponds, ditches. All right, so those river, ooh, bird bath is a new one, swamp, good. Rainwater drainage, absolutely. So all of those things could be good sources of water. And again, it just kind of depends on the size of the animal. Um, someone mentioned the dew on a grass um, or inside tires laying around. Like even those little tiny things that we might think of, probably it's not a great water source. Like I personally would not drink the water that was sitting in a tire for six months. But if you're an animal, that's what there is. That's what's available. And they, you know, that's, that's their source of water. So. It could be something as small as the dew on a grass or a horse tank, or if you're a larger animal like a deer or an elk, um, you might get water from the river or the lake or a pond. But someone also mentioned like your backyard. So um, if any of you like to feed birds, more than likely you probably have bird feeders and you probably have bird waterers. So like a um, bird bath or something like that. So that is a great source of water. Also, it could be a good source of water for my dog. My dog likes to drink out of the bird bath. I don't know why, but he does. Um, and there are also things like bees that um, will sit in the, or go in the water and skim it. So it could be a very wide range of examples as far as a water source. So what we're going to do today, um, we talked about where those animals would find a water source, different types of animals. Um, but what we're going to do is I'm gonna show you in a second here, kind of a variety of images and I want you to think about um, maybe what type of um, animals that you might see in this area, and then what, some wa what are some water sources that they might get in those areas. And they're gonna be very different from each other. All right, so uh, like I mentioned, I'm gonna show you about five, I think four or five pictures. And I want you to think about what animals you might see in that environment and where their water sources might come from. Okay, so first one, super green space is here, but what type of animals might you see in this kind of setting? And what are some water sources that they might have? Someone said bird, yeah, there's a lot of pigeons in cities, hawks, bees, rats, birds, birds and fountains, domestic animals, good. There's probably a lot of feral cats around there. There might be some stray dogs, rats, yes. So there's a lot of different places. Um, this is a very obviously highly populated area. Um, you're not probably gonna see a lot of things like foxes and coyotes in this area. Um, depending on where you are, I'm not sure where it is in the world, um, but you might see, uh, someone said actually geckos, that's not a, um, far off thing at all. You might definitely see some uh, big cities, even in like when we went to Puerto Rico, like the main city of San Juan is very metropolized, very lot of people, um, but there's still uh, lizards and anoles in 
like hotels or on the building. So it's not super weird at all. Cat, someone said, good. Yeah, so this place might not have super easy water sources. If there's a fountain or something, um, there might be a good space for like a bee or someone said some rats to come or uh, things like a cat or something like that. There might be some um, uh, balconies that have things like bird baths or things like that. That could absolutely be something. Also, if you think about it, there's a lot of puddles. Now we're not talking super clean water here, um, but it's still a water source. And that could be for a lot of things like insects or someone said mice and rats and dogs and cats and things like that. Most of the time you're gonna find a lot of things like um, uh, domesticated animals here, but there's also quite a bit of urban wildlife out here too. Someone mentioned things like hawks um, in Nebraska, for instance, in our state capitol building, the peregrine falcons will roost on the top. And so that's a really large raptor that we have that's super urbanized. Oh yeah, gray side raccoon too. Absolutely, you might find some raccoons. Looks like there's a swimming pool and a lake in the background. Yeah, so there's a good water source. Some of those animals, again, they might not wanna travel that far, but if it's a larger animal and that's the only water source, absolutely. All right, here's your next one. What are some types of animals that you might see in this area and where's gonna be their water sources? Cows, horses, deer, squirrels, foxes, mosquitoes, raccoons, mice. That's lots more animals, right? Coyote, yeah. What are some water sources that you might, animals might use in this area? Someone said water runoff from tanks, puddles, fields ditches, puddles, irrigation ditches, vegetation. Awesome. All of those things are correct. Yeah. So this one actually has those visible puddles and ditches here. It might have just rained. Um, so those are uh, clearly some areas that collect water, but also someone said things like the dew, um, livestock tanks or irrigation ditches. All of those places are um, good water sources for the wildlife that would be out here. This one's obviously a little more obvious, I guess, to find things. Um, so good job. All right, this one's obvious too, but um, what type of animals might you find here? And what would be some good water sources? Bees, swans, ducks, fish, birds, butterflies, lots of butterflies. There's lots of flowers, right? There's clearly gonna be pollinators. Butterflies, yeah. Water sources, stream, rain, water puddles. There's clearly a large water source right in the center here. So um, this is also something that's probably a permanent water source, something that's not going to dry up fairly easily with the bridge right there. Um, but yes, larger animals like deer and then things like butterflies. Um, what else did people, whoops. Um, fish, there obviously could be fish in here. I have no idea, rabbits, bees. Uh, someone said flowers, so they obviously need a water source too. They have to, um, they can't move to go get their water, um, but certain, like Grace talked about adaptation, certain flowers have certain adaptations that allow them to either hold water in um, or find water in a different way. Someone said turtles too, absolutely. All right, last one. What animals might you find? Obviously not maybe right in the sidewalk, but what are some things that you might find? Millipede, beetles, ants, snakes, yep, centipedes. So fairly small animals, right? I don't know how many of you guys um, have younger kids or grandkids or anything, but my daughter would sit and watch an anthill for three hours. And we've have watched ants for a long time. So great habitat right here with the cracks to find many different types of animals. Sometimes you also might find flowers um, that sprout up between the cracks in the sidewalk, like dandelions are pretty resilient in that matter. I think there's even some space over here. You can start to see some green um, as well. So things like moss um, and some lichen maybe, but there's gonna be water in the cracks, right? So after it rains, puddle, if it rains hard, there might be some puddles that form in like the divot of a crack in the sidewalk or in the literal cracks of a sidewalk. 
that might be a great water source for a bunch of things like roly polies and millipedes and centipedes and things like that and ants. So um, even a larger animal, if it's a big enough crack, they might find um, that space handy as well, like a bird or a raccoon or something as well. All right. Oh, I lied. One more. What type of animals might you find here? Maybe you don't want to find them, but they could be living in this area. And what could be some water sources? Cooties, <laughs> beetles, flies, <clears throat> bed bugs, spiders. Again, things that you might not want to find, but could be here. Cockroaches, yes. You guys ever gone to like a corner of the room sometimes and you see a bunch of like uh, stringy spider webs um, or cobwebs in the area and you're like, yep, I know spiders have been here, so. Uh, yeah, so even in an area that's not even outside, this could be a place where there's um, uh, animals or technically wildlife. So box elder bugs, someone mentioned, there could be some larger things like mice and ants and cockroaches, spiders, flies, hopefully no bed bugs, but again, you don't know. Um, every once in a while, there could be a stray snake, who knows too. So uh, someone said like if the water glasses spilled onto the carpet, yeah, um, that sounds kind of silly, but if it's a water source that an animal could use, it will find it. Uh, also, things that could happen is if they, you know, go into the bathrooms, it's obviously very misty in there. So when we talk about a water source, it's not, not every single animal will drink water. Uh, for instance, a frog never drinks or laps up water. It literally has to sit in the water and will absorb it. So some animals will even get all of their water from the food that they eat. Um, a th an animal called a grasshopper mouse that we have here in Nebraska, it will get all of its water sources from the food that it eats and it eats other animals. So it literally gets its water from the animals that it eats. Um, so there's a lot of animals that don't necessarily need to find a puddle or a pond or anything like that. All right, so, which animal or which places do you think the animals would best find? Like, where would you find the most diversity of animals? And thinking about that, is there a relationship between the presence of water and the presence of wildlife? Go ahead and I'll give you a 30 so seconds to think about that or think about that. So, is there a relationship between the presence of water and the presence of wildlife? So someone said they think the most diversity, there'd be um, river or pond. Absolutely. Yes, there is a relationship. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, lakes and ponds. Yeah, so basically what we're telling you is that animals need water. And oftentimes when there is a water source like a river or a pond or a lake, there tends to be a lot of wildlife because a lot of animals need water and that's a great place to live. Um, usually the wa larger water source, um, yeah, someone said larger water sources um, oftentimes yield more animals. Um, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does, but again, it's just depending on the environment. So oftentimes where the water is, is where the animals will go. All right, so now what I want you to do, hopefully you have a piece of paper and a pen or pencil handy, but I want you to think about where you live. And you can either do it on a scale of your house and like an aerial view of your house. If I was looking down and around your area, your apartment, your house, um, wherever you're living, and think about some water sources that animals could use. Or if you want to think large scale, think about your block or your neighborhood. All right, so I want you to draw, if you want to, um, a rough sketch of your neighborhood or just like an aerial view of your house and think about water sources that um, an animal like a deer, a human, a spider, a snake, or a bird could use. Don't have to be all of them, um, but think about these animals. What kind of water source could they use around your neighborhood or around your house? If for some reason you live right in the middle of the like a huge city like Omaha, and a deer wandered into your area, where, where would they get a water source? So go ahead and take um, maybe a couple of minutes 
and sketch out some water sources or your neighborhood, your house, wherever, and think about where these animals could get a water source. I'll give you a couple minutes and like Grace mentioned earlier, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or um, unmute yourself and ask. I'm gonna do one thing here really quick and I will share my screen back. Yeah, some people are putting some things in the chat like a swimming pool, a water fountain, outdoor plants, under pots, drain pipes, sprinklers. You probably need a lot of sprinklers because it's so dry. Runoff from sprinklers, a nearby creek or a sewer, drainage ditch behind our house, neighbor's pond. Yeah. Bird bath sprinklers, leaves from plants. I like that we're thinking large scale too, but you're also mentioning things like when you water a plant, the water that runs out and collects underneath the pot. Um, those are perfect areas if you've ever like lifted them up. Sometimes centipedes will go in there, roly poly bugs will be there, ants will be there. Um, it's actually a very good diversity um, of animals that could be there because so many small animals don't want to go to a large water source because they'll drown. Um, if you have like pollinator gardens or anything, People always tell you to get a very, very shallow dish and sometimes fill it with marbles or rocks so that pollinators can land on them and get the water without having, it'd be like us if someone dropped us in the middle of the ocean. It's terrifying, you don't wanna drown. So you need something to stand on. Someone said they live by a creek, have a bird waterer, um, huge garden, so puddles, water in the gutters, the sewer entrance, irrigation reuse pits, yes. Dripping hose is another good one. Yes, that could be an awesome water source for very, very small animals. All right, I think, all right. Um, some people already did share, um, put turtle ramps in our big tanks. Yes, that's awesome. Um, people were talking, we were talking about salamanders earlier. A lot of times stock tanks are perfect places for salamanders to like metamorphosis and change. They'll spend their um, early times in there and they'll lay their, um, they'll basically have their tadpole, salamander tadpoles, and they'll change in there and then they'll crawl out as adults. So stock tanks are awesome for amphibians. All right, is there anyone else that wanted to share either their drawing or um, their water sources that they came up with? If not, I know we kind of talked about it in the chat too, but going once, twice, three times. Okay. Um, so uh, one thing I do really quick want to mention too is I earlier I said that this was a better activity if you can physically go out. Um, so for instance, if you do this around your library in the book, they give you a very cool little like note card kind of thing um, and that you can use this or you can use your own, but on the top it talks about wildlife signs. So many young people and adults even if they don't see an animal, they think there's nothing there. If they physically do not see that bird, there's no birds around. But what are some ways that you can figure out if that bird is actually there? You can hear it. You might find little tracks. Maybe you found half a rob, or sorry, not half a coven, half of a earthworm sitting on a crack. Clearly some type of animal was trying to eat that earthworm. Um, so there's many signs of animals, even if you don't physically see them with your eyes. So getting students to be observed observatory. Yes, yeah, someone said nesting sites. Um, so things that you can see that you might know that an animal's there without ever seeing it. So looking for wildlife signs will also get you interested in finding those water sources. So taking your journal or your um, note cards from the books and getting students outside, even around your library, there are going to be sources and signs of wildlife, and there's going to be lots of places for those animals to use water. Someone said you can look for feathers and poop. Absolutely. 
All right, so what are some extensions for this activity? So um, this one, you can create a field guide. So let's say you have a group of 20 some students or 10 students, you take them out, they each make their wildlife sign cards and they um, decide to, yes, someone said they, that's fine. Um, so creating a field guide into doing this, so taking all of those note cards and putting them together and creating a field guide for the library around. How specific is that for your library? Um, you can also classify the animals that you find into different categories. So now it's becoming a math activity, um, especially for younger students with that lower elementary. You can talk about, um, okay, so I saw three birds. So those birds are in this category. Uh, spiders are over here. Centipedes are over here. Millipedes are over here. So creating and classifying those groups as well. And then something else is you can literally follow your water source. So talking about people, where do we get our water? Well, I have a water cup right here, but clearly my water comes from somewhere else. Um, if you ask a lot of people, the faucet is a great um, answer that I hear a lot, but yes, but where does the faucet get its water? So you can call your local utilities area. You can probably find it online and literally trace a map of where your water specifically comes from. Maybe it's a well, maybe it is from Lincoln um, in our Lincoln water utility. So there's a lot of different places that you can do and a lot of cool extensions to do with this activity as well. Grace, did you want to add anything? For this one or no I just I love I love how you made this a virtual version I think you did an awesome job so um it's cool to think about this and I think it just did a really great job of uh, I think solidifying how many different sources of water there are and how different they all are so yeah it's really cool yes all right so one last activity take a deep breath stretch your legs out for a second <laughs> Um, we're almost through all of it, so thanks for hanging on. Um, so this last activity is called Wetland Metaphors. And as you kind of talked about in the last activity, um, and, and I think it really solidified that there, depending on the type of body of water you have, you might have more diversity and biodiversity than others. So we're gonna talk about wetlands and wetlands are one of my favorites because they are just, an amazing place where lots of lots of species live, plants, animals, fungi, all kinds of things. So um, what is a wetland is something that just, I want you to think about for a second because we all might have different ideas of what a wetland is in our head um, because there are lots of different kinds of wetlands. Uh, we know that if we were to say there were three key things about a wetland that help us know it is a wetland is the type of soil that's there is very unique because it's developed there in oftentimes conditions that don't have much, much oxygen. So a lot of times that type of soil in wetlands will be maybe smelly or it'll be interesting colors. Or I know I was even out by, um, oh, Chimney Rock this last summer and there are some really cool wetlands out there called alkali wetlands and they're very um, they had very powdery soil that's like kind of wet or uh, sorry, um, white and has like salts in it. So there's all kinds of cool soils that wetlands can have. Um, also, the hydrology is really important. So the type different amounts of water that you can find in wetlands can definitely change depending on the season. And then the last thing that makes a wetland a wetland is their plant community is usually very different. Like we covered in this last activity, um, you know, a desert is going to look very different and who lives there is going to look very different um, because they support different kinds of plants. So same thing goes for wetlands, they support very unique types of plants. The other thing, since this is called wetland metaphors, I just wanted to make sure we cover what is a metaphor because I kind of confuse them in my mind a lot. So I wanted to make sure we just cover that. So it's a thing that is re representative or symbolic of something else. So saying like, you have a heart of gold, right? Or um, yeah, I don't know. That's like one of the greatest examples I, I like to think of. So saying that something is something else, even though it might not be exactly true, it helps us understand and explain an idea. So we kind of have this activity with wetland metaphors. And so I think, yeah, so what, so usually I kind of like to have physical objects. So if you were able to put together I'm gonna show you these objects obviously on the screen, but if you were able to put together a little kit of all of these things, or even, you know, 
you were looking for a list, we could definitely provide you with one. We have our own kit in our office and we like to take those physical things because it's fun to sit in a circle and kind of pass the items around and talk about, you know, why, why does this, why, how could this relate to a wetland? It's kind of fun to have something in your hand. And in the book, it actually does give you a nice list of stuff too. Oh, perfect. But if yeah. you're like, <laughs> I don't like those, then yeah, you can tell Grace and I, and we can get you something too. Yeah. I forget we have a curriculum we're going off of here. Okay. <laughs> so the first one uh, that I show you is a pillow. So I want you to just think about that for a second, and then you can use the chat or answer out loud and um, share. Why do you think we would say a pillow, a wetland is a pillow? or something similar? How can a pillow relate to a wetland? So feel free, remember, it's okay to be wrong. We're not judging you, because this is just to learn. Love it. Carrie says, a place to rest. And the other one I've been getting a lot is that it's soft and squishy, and I love that. <laughs> Comforting, calm, soft vegetation. Those are great, thank you, thank you very much. Place to sleep. Yeah, and if you have something else, feel free to keep putting it in there. So we like to say that, you know, wetlands can definitely, wetlands are a place to rest. They're a place where a lot of animals like to stop. And, you know, in Nebraska, everyone kind of is aware of the fact that we have a lot of sandhill cranes that travel through our state um, and stop on the Platte River and the wetlands associated with the Platte River. So they are, they are an essential place to stop rest, get some energy back with eating, um, refresh their refresh their energy reserves by eating there because there's usually a lot of food. And then um, I like that soft and squishy one. I've been getting that a lot lately. And usually that is pretty true about wetlands. Sometimes, sometimes they can dry out and then they're not so soft and squishy. But um, overall, I would agree that most of the times wetlands are going to be really, really pretty soft. So, so yeah, that's item number one. We'll go to item two, we have a sponge. So go ahead and think about that for a minute and then you can put, put your thoughts in the chat about how does a sponge relate to a wetland? We've got some absorbent, squelchy mud. I love those words there. Holds water, it can be saturated with water. Textured, yes and soggy. So yeah, we like to call them ecosystem services. So providing a service to humans is something that wetlands actually do pretty well for us. So if we, um, if we experience major flood events, usually a wetland can act like a sponge and absorb a lot of that water for us. Um, and it helps protect a lot of our buildings or places that we value. Um, obviously, sometimes that's not always how it works because there's too much water. But um, the wetlands do, do have a excellent ability to absorb water or hold extra water. And so that's why it's always important to kind of leave some of those spaces even along rivers, you know, because it's a natural process that rivers flood. And so wetlands are a great, great attachment onto rivers or other places because they can, they can handle that and that's what they're designed to do. That's how they have existed for a long, long time. So. Definitely great guesses there and, and ideas. Wetlands are definitely a sponge. So we can go on to that next one. All right, uh, so we have an egg beater. So go ahead and put in the chat what you think, how could this relate to a wetland? This one's a little harder. I like this water movement, areas are mixed up. Mixture of all plants and animals, I like that one. I haven't actually heard that one before. Okay, yeah, this one's a little trickier. Churns the soil up, yes, mixture of everything. So um, a lot of times when you have a wetland, there's water coming into that wetland that is moving, either from a river, a stream, a creek. And as that water moves in, it does kind of churn things around mixes things in the water up and then eventually as it moves into that wetland it will settle and a lot of times that's how um, wetlands are really beneficial if there's some toxicity in the water from a flooding event or something 
a lot of times then that mixing and then settling out is a really important thing that wetlands can do is, is settle out a lot of those sediments, things that we might not want so much, um, you know, to continue down through our watershed. So, so yeah, this one might be a little trickier with long, younger kids, but um, still, still a good one. And finding an egg beater is pretty easy. <laughs> Um, all right, we got a cradle. So go ahead and put your ideas about why we would have a cradle and a wetland together related. Let's see, constructing, nursery, babies, nesting or a spawning place, place to sleep, definitely true. A place for giving birth, home for animals and their young, protection. Nice, these are all excellent. So wetlands are an amazing place for lots of lots of animals, fish, mammals, birds, all different varieties of types of animals and plants to reproduce and grow because there are lots of places to hide. There's lots of food um, and that abundance of resources is really helpful for a lot of, a lot of living things to continue their life cycle. Um, and to feel safe. So you can see there's a cute little baby beaver there on the edge of a wetland. And so, yeah, wetlands are excellent, excellent places for, um, you know, all kinds of species to have their young. And so if you get a chance, you know, this, we're about to be full force into spring, even if it doesn't feel like it quite yet, um, it's coming. And so that's a great time to get out into wetlands before before all the young mosquitoes make their appearance um, and to really get to see some of these cool life cycles going on in wetlands. All right, I believe this is our last item to show you. So again, you can type some things in the chat. How does this relate to a wetland? Gale cells filter. Or a dam, mm -hmm. filters water, cleans it. Yep, this one's pretty simple, straightforward. But uh, yeah, strainer, a wetland is a strainer because it does, similar to the egg beater, but it does really help filter or capture things out of the water. Like um, a lot of those unique plants, even sometimes cattails can absorb and filter into their roots. Um, some of some of the pollution that might be in the water and that can help remove some of the some of the pollution that's found there. So so wetlands are just really all around pretty pretty amazing places. And even though they are all different, um, I have to do a mini plug for um, we're working at Game of Parks on a big wetlands outreach and education project that's super exciting and we will have some cool videos. Uh, we're working with Platte Basin Time Lapse on these. So if you're not familiar with them, Platte Basin Time Lapse, I recommend looking them up because they do really cool visual work throughout Nebraska and the Platte Basin watershed. And so they they and, and Game and Parks have we've been working together to create some really cool products and they're not quite done yet, but we'll have wetlandology magazines for kids and um, you know, just all kinds of cool products from that, that we hope will help people see Nebraska's diverse wetlands. So be watching for that. And we'll try to let you guys know when that's ready, but yeah, I think that was it. But yeah, um, one other question is just to think about how does wetland health impact us? Does it matter? Are we related at all? What do people think about wetlands, their health? human health, how it all comes together. Any ideas? Yeah, we've got provides food, biodiversity, and tourism. Those are all great, great things that wetlands and just water in general can give us. So we can't stress the importance of water enough for our ecosystem. Because honestly, if our ecosystems are healthy, then we're going to be healthy too. Um, and so a lot of our, yeah, like hunting, um, having safe spaces for those places that, you know, birds and different things travel through, these are super important for us to be able to continue relying on them for the things that we need, like food and water, okay, and then even some of our shelter and space. So 
we have some of those needs as well. So just important to keep that in mind. And um, it's not in here, but an easy activity that you can do as well is honestly taking kids outside to, to pick up different items of trash, obviously in a safe way, but a lot of times if it rains hard, all that trash is gonna run into wherever your water is. So it's always a, a little bonus activity I'll just throw in there is you know going on a walk around to look for different different items of trash because that's an easy one that we can all do. So yeah, I'm good. Okay, awesome. All right, so we just have one last thing I wanna do with you is so when you get your aquatic wild guides, I just wanna make sure that you kind of know what you're looking at. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and I have a um, sample page for you that is taken out of the actual guide. So here is what the guide will actually look like when you get it. Uh, so this is a uh, activity called net gain, net effect. So every activity will be laid out the exact same way. Um, so nothing will be changed and nothing will be new. So over here on the right-hand side, we'll show you all of your kind of quick information. So your grade level. So please do not look at this and think middle school, oh, I can't do it and just move on because I, I think Grace will attest to this. That is not true. So just because it says middle school doesn't mean you have to do this with middle school students. Um, you just might have to take a little more finessing on how to make it for younger students or older students. So. It tells you the grade level that this is written at and kind of used for, but again, it does not mean you can only do it with those students. Um, content areas, so you're learning math, you're doing social studies, environmental education, you're doing a lot of science, and then the method on how you do them. So students will conduct a simulation to explore the evolution of fishing and the effects of changing technology on fish populations. This might be a little too much in depth about what you want to do, but that is the method on how this activity does it. And it tells you your materials, average activity time, it says either one to 60 minute session. Some of them say two days, some of, some of them say 20 minutes. So it just kind of depends. And then people power, there are some activities that you need a certain number of students to do to kind of make them effective. Um, there's one activity in Project Wild that I really love called Oh Dear, but it's really hard to do that activity with two people. You need at least 10 because you're running back and forth and it's a game. And otherwise you're doing the same thing over and over with two people. So it just doesn't make it quite as effective. And then setting, is it indoors or outdoors? Um, this conceptual framework, this is really for those standards based. So in the back of the book, then you can look under the topic reference and say, Okay, I don't know what ECIB means, but you can look back there and say, okay, this activity covers this topic, this standard, this standard, this standard, this standard. And then terms to know, um, these are just some vocabulary words. And then the appendency is also talking about like, let's go fishing, um, using local resources. So just some extra resources for you. And then looking at this, um, so if you're flipping through really quick, you see the title up here. And then here's a question basically, what is this activity trying to answer? So this one's talking about how do technological advances in commercial fishing affect fish populations? It tells you your objectives. And then this background information, I think is super helpful because if you don't know a lot about fishing and fish populations and technology, which I can't really say that I do, this is all the information that you need to know to do this activity. So it's all laid out here for you. So then on the next page, it um, talks a little bit more. This one has a lot of background information, which makes sense. Um, but then it also talks about, again, more background information. This is really long. Um, and then your procedure. So step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. And then they updated both Project Wild and Aquatic Wild within the last five years, and they're very interconnected. So um, the wild work that you will see, this talks about, um, kind of like how to do this activity, but in Project Wild. So it really connects the two. And then Project Wild has, how do you do this activity in Aquatic Wild? So like I said, they're very interconnected and there's a lot of talk about careers in here as well. So um, talking about what's a wildlife communication specialist. I didn't even know that was a career or a wildlife education officer or a game warden or a fishery scientist. It also gives you some really good information on the National Project Wild website about where you can find more information. And then also STEM is a huge, huge connection 
with both Project Wild and Aquatic Wild. So that science, techn technology, engineering, mathematics concept. Um, and it gives you how to make the STEM friendly. Uh, again, this is a very long um, activity, but then it, like Grace and I talked about extensions. This one has a lot of extensions, which is really nice. And then an assessment. How do you know your students learn something um, by doing this? And then some of them, like you mentioned earlier, we did uh, Fashion of Fish, the Water Safari. They have some extra things that you can copy. So the little four students here, the whole book is actually copyrighted, but you can copy the pages that say for students because you have to have them to do this activity. Um, I will also put in the chat, if you didn't wanna use the book to copy, you can go to this website and every single activity is listed. You click on it and it goes right to the PDF of the, this data sheet, for instance. It won't give you the whole activity, but it will just give you like those extra sheets just because it's easier than trying to copy from the book. All right, any questions on that? I will really quick get that um, resource guide for you with the PDFs on it. Um, Sorry, I have Project Wild. I don't have. You want me to find it? Yeah. Where do you want to find that if I yep. kind of keep going? Okay, perfect. Grace will put that in the chat for you guys. All right. So one more last thing for you. All right. All right. So here is Grayson, my um, email address. So if you get stuck looking at something, you want to do some brain bouncing with us, please feel free to email us. We also have, again, those. Um, education kits that you can check out. So if you need more information on those, it does tell you a phone number. Um, you can contact at least um, that phone number as well. Or if you just want more information, you can contact Grace and I. So here's our information as well. And then I do have a Survey Monkey link for you. And I will um, pause here in a second. But what we will do is we will have you fill out this Survey Monkey link. Um, it will kind of ask you you know, what were the objectives? Were they important to you in this? Did you learn something in this? Was it worth your time kind of thing? Um, please be honest with us because we do change our workshops depending on what people say. And um, obviously we would love to do this in person. So hopefully the virtualness of this um, was useful for you and you've got some good ideas and you're excited about Aquatic Wild. But um, what we will do is we will uh, ask for like your name and address and things like that. This is where we would like to have you um, tell us where you want your book mailed. So if it's your library, if it's your home address, um, some PO boxes, just a cautionary thing, some PO boxes don't let us mail. Um, so if you have like a physical address, like your library or something, that would maybe be the best. Um, give us a couple weeks to get you. We will give you your certificate um, saying that you are trained in Aquatic Wild, your book, and then we will also send you some goodies. So we won't tell you what, but we'll send you some goodies. So Anyone have any questions? Otherwise, I'll put that survey monkey link in there. Please feel free to fill that out like right now um, because it will close within 48 hours. So that just kind of tells us these are the people that attended. You stayed till the end of the workshop and you get your resources. So we really appreciate you. Um, thank you for being um, participants and engaging. Um, anything else, Grace, that you wanna mention? I, yeah, I don't think anything else, but yeah, just make sure you fill that survey out right away because then it's, it's easier than forgetting um, and then not having access to it anymore. So thank you yes. all for doing also a great job just sharing with us in the chat along the way and, um, you know, being, being engaged. We appreciate it. So um, yeah, I don't think I yeah. have anything else specific though. I will get that survey right now. All right. I'm putting it in the chat. It should only take about minute, two minutes to fill out. So please do it right now so that you can get your resources. So, All right. Yeah, we'll probably just hang out so that you still have access to the survey link for a little while. Um, but once, if you click it and you're gone to the survey, you're good to head out of this Zoom meeting. So thanks everybody. Really appreciate here at the system, your your willingness to come and do this extended workshop for us because there's so many resources i couldn't believe how many resources there were like those trunks and the trailers and the 
oh my goodness, I, I just, you could plan a whole day or a weekend crazy event with those things. So, and they're free. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Free. yeah. We do more than hunting and fishing. So yes, you do. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with our librarians. Appreciate yeah. Thanks it. for having us on today too. Thank you. All right. Everyone's good. We'll head out. You got the link. And if for some reason you can't get it to work, um, I mean, I'm a structural person, so I'll put it in there one more time, just in case. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll uh, see you later. <laughs>